My uh, father started the Leonardo Journal, but in fact, his first claim to fame was he was a research engineer and the first director of the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. And when I was growing up, I had a very confused childhood because I knew my father was a research engineer, but when I came home from primary school, he was there painting. And so that's what I thought engineers did. <laughs> um, little did I realize that in fact, that's not what engineers are encouraged to do uh, in normal situations. And so indeed, he had a very much a, a hybrid career. So tonight, um, I'm just gonna run through a few thoughts. There we go. So as JD mentioned, I now, I jump without a parachute into a new position at the University of Texas, Dallas, where I'm both a professor of physics and a professor of art and humanities. Um, and I've been executive editor of the Leonardo publications uh, since 1982, which is when my father died and I inherited the problem. Um, and I'd like to just give you a little bit of perspective uh, from that experience of being a witness to a growing, emerging, exciting area of human activity. Um, just mentioned that I also am still working with an institute for advanced study that we set up in Marseille, where we have an art science residence program. And it's, to my knowledge, one of the few places where we have scientists in residence that work with artists. So uh, usually you hear about artists in residence, not scientists in residence. Um, so the Leonardo organization uh, was created really to advocate the work of artists involved with science and technology. Really simple, but not obvious. Um, art and science, uh, all fields of science, physical sciences, social sciences, human sciences, uh, but also art and emerging technologies. And so it's really been a place to really advocate this kind of a hybrid interdisciplinary work for over 45 years. We publish books and, and journals at MIT Press. Um, and over that period, we've published something like 7,000 auth separate authors. And I always like to say, and some of the people here have heard this before, if you took those 7,000 people with their families and kids, that's a larger creative community than fuel the Renaissance in Europe that we all look to as one of the models uh, for, for a creative transition in our societies. So indeed, there's a, a really interesting phenomenon going on today uh, that this network for science engineering uh, and design. So what, what's going on? Um, in the 1970s, uh, we started documenting the first work of artists trying to use computers. And let me tell you, the art world said, you can't use a computer to make art. It's a calculating machine. Well, little did we know that there'd now be industries today based upon the work of those pioneers. And obviously, the home computer, interactive multimedia. But then artists started experimenting with other technologies, holography, space technologies, the web, visualization, and social media, of course. But then, about 15 years ago, this just kind of went ballistic. Artists started working in biology labs, genetics labs, ecology labs, health sciences, nanosciences, synthetic biology is really hot at the moment, geosciences, chemistry, and the neurosciences. The artists are investing all fields of scientific research today with new kinds of hybrid uh, uh, practices. And that's part of what this network for science engineering and art and design is trying to recognize and formulate uh, some idea of where we might go. And uh, as we discussed during the day today, this, this community is very driven by hard problems. Um, and it's sort of interesting, um, artists love human beings in all their complexity. <laughs> Scientists like to reduce them to very simple systems. But artists really want to take on the whole human being, and there are so many hard problems uh, on the agenda. So what else is going on? So um, we're in Washington. So when something's going on, you go commission a study. <laughs> um, as part of the study that we've just finished completing, we inventoried about 35 international studies on what's going on linking earth science, engineering, and design. Um, it was a little bit depressing reading, actually, because already 30 years ago, people saw this coming and made recommendations, and most of them never got implemented. Um, but we're now catching up. Of course, in the 1990s, uh, in England, uh, there was a huge movement on what's now called the creative industries, uh, with really new funding mechanisms uh, into this creative community. Um, 
In 2003, uh, there was a process that led to uh, an NRC report called Beyond Productivity. And Pamela Jennings, are you here? We should just acknowledge the, the midwife <laughs> uh, of some of the following activities from, and is, is uh, Marjorie here? I guess not tonight. Um, um, so there's a community of people that drove uh, trying to understand what was going on. The Beyond Productivity Report was very influential and led to a number of next steps, including uh, the funding that, uh, that Pamela was able to enable at the NSF uh, for this network. And over the last couple of years, there have been regular workshops bringing together this very hybrid community of researchers and creative uh, people. Uh, one of the things that's going on is the tree of knowledge has collapsed. Someone cut it down. It's now a network of knowledge. And let me tell you, it's really easier to connect nodes and networks than branches and trees. Uh, and so it's a very simple thing. We all know about the network uh, culture and network knowledge. But this has really dramatically changed the way we think about hybrid practices. Uh, and this is click data on the web showing how different disciplines get connected together as people are doing their research. Um, coming out of one of the first workshops, and is Fox Harrell here, um, there was a gap analysis, as it's called in Washington, really looking at the current state of things and what the future state might be and what were the gulfs or the abyss or the gaps uh, to get there. Uh, that was sort of a really interesting and important framing analysis that led to uh, the uh, grant from the NSF, the Network for Science, Engineering, Arts, and Design, and Carol Lafayette, you here, is the PI. She's probably collapsed, exhausted <laughs> tonight. Um, and we've been working over the last 18 months uh, really uh, looking at the emerging practices that are going on. Um, We've identified an axis for culture and economic development. As I said, this community is working on hard problems, including how our communities survive the rapidly changing economic environment. We have an axis for research and creative work, an axis for learning and education, and an axis for collaboration and partnership. Uh, those are sort of structuring ideas that have led uh, us on our analysis. As part of that, and Carol Strohecker, who's here and is going to speak later, and I co-chaired a white paper study um, with a number of collaborators, Carol Lafayette that I mentioned, and Amy Ione, are you in the room? Uh, yes, she's over there. Uh, and we put together an international steering group, and we did a stupid thing. We put out a call for position papers. And we thought we might get six or seven or something, and we, we got a deluge of community input. We ended up with something like 85 uh, position papers. There were 107, oops, 70 uh, participants, 180 participants in those. We had a number of what we called meta-analyses, looking at all this data, uh, and 260 suggested actions. This is a community that knows what it needs. Um, and so indeed, we've clustered that, 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 the, those recommendations and suggested actions. It's a very hybrid community, really interesting. 11% scientists, 22% engineers, 39% we've combined arts and humanities here, 9% design, 6% education, and 13% other. A very hybrid community, a practice of people collaborating with each other. In addition, in the demographics that we got, to our amazement, it was gender balanced, 50% women, 50% men. So let me tell you, that seems to be the nature of this creative community. Uh, it is a very well uh, integrated uh, community. Uh, we got responses from, uh, half of our responses were from North America, half from the rest of the world. A particular interest, we identified what we called a cohort of hybrids. That is professionals that have one advanced degree in arts and design and one advanced degree in science or engineering. And there are more of these people than you think. <laughs> Uh, and it's a growing cohort of professionals. All kinds of interesting projects, mobile technologies in rural communities, uh, including uh, art galleries. Uh, this is Bryan, Texas, I think, this example. Um, or, um, Ruth West, are you there? Yeah, Ruth just walked in. Molecular biologists working on genomic information with new kinds of interactive visualization techniques leading to new scientific discoveries. 
uh, is, um, <sighs> I've forgotten your name, <laughs> Francesca. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, I think this is the spread of epidemics, as I remember. Okay, so amazing examples of very advanced work going on. Digital manufacturing, a big topic today. Uh, all the 16-year-olds on this planet want to go do 3D printing. Um, a movement that is called the STEM to STEAM movement. You probably know what STEM education is to attract young people into science, technology, engineering, or math careers. The idea behind STEAM is to integrate the arts and humanities and design into STEM methodologies and attract people who would never think of themselves as a possible engineer. And let me tell you, it's been a delight meeting 16-year-olds who suddenly say, oh, I want to be an engineer. I didn't know that's what they did. Um, how am I doing on time? OK. Um, so we, we clustered the recommendations, uh, the suggested actions that we got. And I think it's just sort of interesting to see how we're thinking. The first one is what we call translating. So one of the big problems is how you actually get communities using new knowledge in daily life. And that just doesn't happen automatically. You have to have strategies for do that, to do that. In medical research, it's called translational medicine. Uh, so the, the medical researchers have understood that you have to have uh, uh, such strategies. The second one is we call convening. This is a really strange hybrid community that's in this room tonight. I'm not going to ask you all what your profession is, but you don't normally meet. <laughs> I'm an astronomer. I go to the American Astronomical Society meeting. I never go to the American Chemical Society meeting, even though my colleagues are also working with artists. And so we need to convene these people in different kinds of ways, and the Deser Salon is one of those mechanisms. Enabling, establishing safe places for hybrid individuals and practices. These people are taking risks. They're taking personal risks, professional risks. I, we, you know, we like to say in Texas that we're training people for jobs that don't exist yet, trying to explain that to the parents of the kids. <laughs> um, so indeed, you need strategies for creating safe places for this kind of experimental work, including for the same reasons that we think it's important to create interactions between science, engineering, art, and design, we want to include all kinds of people in this discussion. And I'll just mention that, as you probably know, the hacker and maker communities, uh, people under the age of 30 are normally not uh, in Washington meetings. We have to find a way to get uh, those people into these discussions and helping chart the future directions. But then I always like to say the largest growing resource on the planet is retired people who no longer have professional affiliations uh, and it's very important that we find ways to work with them. So I'm just going to skip uh, to the end here. Um, you can read our report. I just wanted to mention the last category. Um, it's a little bit unusual to find this category in an NSF-funded uh, study. We initially called it well-being, joy, and lust. And we decided we couldn't put that in a study funded by the US government. But fundamentally, people are driven by their passions, by their excitement, by their desire to do things, to feel good about the world they live in. And that's important in itself. <laughs> and so uh, we, we really highlighted uh, in the work we're doing not only the issue of ethics and values, because so often science and technology today conflicts with very deep human values and, and, and ways of thinking about the world, uh, and then well-being uh, and joyfulness. So uh, very unusual to see in something funded by the, by the NSF. And so I'll just wrap up. One of the other projects, and is Thanasis in the room tonight? Uh, I think he caught a train. Uh, there's also a parallel effort called the XSEED platform, which is an experimental platform for finding new ways of documenting the work of this community. And so I'm just going to close there. I've probably overrun my time, and JD is about to pull a hook out. It's really exciting at the moment to see the kind of work going on, how this community is, community com is uh, involved in solving some of the very hard problems that people face in their daily lives. And let me tell you, my, be my belief is that begins with the 50 people you know the most closely. And we're all struggling with economic systems that are changing. 
uh, and uh, an, an evolving uh, planet uh, that we don't know how to sustain. So thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to more discussions uh, in the Dazers.